Right, well, uh, good morning, everybody who's watching this live. Uh, it's been a while since I did one of these um, broadcasts. I'm just hoping the sound and visuals are okay before I crack on. Yep, I'm getting nods from outside. So I'm broadcasting this today from our shiny new building near uh, Oxford. And uh, maybe you'll get a look at it later when we switch to camera. Now let's, um, <clears throat> let's crack on with the talk. I know people are probably quite busy and these things tend to take about an hour. So let's get through the slides. So first of all, I want to talk about uh, a little, little recap on what's been going on generally, uh, where things are generally, and where things are moving to in the field with customers. Uh, and for people who are new to uh, nanopore sensing, and if you're watching this from China, this may be quite new to you, um, this talk won't make much sense in isolation. Um, it's part of an unfolding story, and there are at least four other previous talks you can refer back to that if you follow them will tell you the story of the technology and explain it all the way through and I don't have time to cover all the background work this morning uh, because there's too much of it so um, if it doesn't make sense I'd encourage you to go back and look at the older talks. Now uh, the, the company is uh, on a mission to enable anybody to sequence anything anywhere very cheaply and easily and you all know that DNA and RNA are in a really big thing, and you can measure, sequence, count, track all kinds of interesting biological information with DNA sequencing. And we're trying to make devices that uh, work across that entire range. Now, very briefly, I have to do the obligatory how nanopore sequencing works slide, and very briefly, because it must be the 300th time I've explained this in the past 10 years. So, uh, on our devices, we have a chip a sensor which has some custom designed uh, very high fidelity sensors on it, an array of sensors that can measure thousands of electrons per, uh, per, per uh, millisecond. And over those we make a kind of soap bubble of a proprietary membrane into which we insert an engineered nanopore. And then in solution, DNA will get captured by the nanopore and will translocate in one direction through the pore and as it translocates, we can treat the pore a bit like a resistor and measure changes in current. And then we have to decode those current changes into base calls. And that is the essence of nanopore sequencing. Uh, on the current systems, we have uh, usually a, a few thousand pores arrayed. Remind everybody, these are single proteins balancing on a soap bubble on an array that you can post to Australia, or you can put into orbit, and it still works. That's the, the, the heart of our system. Now, here's the product range uh, as it stands. So, <clears throat> the first product we launched was Minion. That's been fully commercially available now for quite a while. And that's a portable USB-powered uh, device. Uh, at one time, 512 channels are working out of 2048. And that's probably the one you've seen the most uh, noise about and in publications and on social media. Around six months ago, we launched Gridiron, which is uh, the one on the center right there. And uh, that's been going very well. That's five flow cells uh, running parallel or individually. Um, most of the same features as, uh, as Minion. Uh, critically, there's much more computing on board with Gridiron and it is licensed for fee-for-service use. Minion is not licensed for fee-for-service use. Minion is a personal DNA sequencer. And we're in the process of launching, we've been in early access quite a while now, launching our Prometheon product, which is the box on the far right-hand side. And uh, this box uh, is aimed at a variety of users, uh, certainly high throughput, high sample laboratories, but it can also scale down. Um, and Promethean has in total 144,000 nanopores running at once in 48 individually usable flow cells um, uh, that can be run on demand with uh, variable runtime. And I'm going to talk about Promethean a little bit later. And then in development, we have Smidgein, which is our uh, scaled down device, which uh, will be attachable to typical mobile phones. And that is a tiny, disposable, cheap version of the chip with fewer pores on it that is targeted at 
large-scale distributed usage of all types. Uh, that's the product range and where we're at right now. And again, there's a lot of stuff out there now that I, you know, I don't need to uh, really um, collate this information. It's all accessible. Um, there's well over 6,000 Minion accounts now, and it, it grows regularly on a monthly basis by a couple of hundred uh, or more accounts per month. And uh, the usage stats of Minion are also increasing quite dramatically as we make it easier to use and more reliable. That's picking up quite dramatically. We've got over 100 grid irons ordered in the first six months, and most of those have now been shipped. And there are people running them, and you can go and find that online. And there are people running more than one. And there are li uh, licensed and accredited service providers now providing for service sequencing on gridiron. And then we've had Promethean out for quite a while. <coughs> and um, the sort of delaying factor on Promethean, as with early Minion, has been just getting the flow cells to the right quality. And I can announce today that we've accomplished that. Uh, those high quality flow cells are now shipping. And uh, customers on Promethean are now getting the kind of yields that uh, trigger full commercialization of Promethean. Now, uh, excitingly, we've just, we've just sort of moved into China. And there should be people watching this presentation from China. I welcome them. Um, we sort of did the rest of the world first. Uh, and because we're, we were a small company, uh, commercializing in China is quite daunting. Uh, but now we're of reasonable size with reasonable revenues. We've now begun to commercialize in China in anger. That started about three months ago. And it started principally actually with, um, with gridiron uh, for various reasons. There's quite a few sold already in, in China. Um, <clears throat> as of, I think, yesterday or the day before yesterday, you can now buy minions in China through our online or our partnered online shop. Uh, and that's direct to customer minion sales. Um, there's a full distribution route now. We expect delivery within 72 hours of an order. Um, although I think the first, the first minions that are sold through this route will reach customers after Chinese New Year for logistical reasons. So uh, we are hoping and anticipating that minion will prove as popular in China as gridiron has so far. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the daunting infrastructure is in place now. Remember, we sell lots of cheap devices. We don't sell a few big expensive ones. It's really quite a different setup. Um, and Gridiron was a good entry point in that respect. And uh, as you can see, a variety of labs in China are now uh, taking the technology up and using it in anger. Um, there's a WeChat channel uh, and there are some nanopore days. And these... I don't think we run these. They're normally run by user groups. I think we might sponsor a few of them or support them. But there are a number of nanopore days coming up in China uh, over the next couple of months. And uh, everybody who goes to them loves them. Uh, so I would recommend if you are new to nanopore, you might want to go and try a nanopore day. And uh, you will learn a lot, I believe. We've seen some publications in China as well uh, coming out on nanopore over the past um, couple of months. And there are some serious service providers now also investing in the technology in anger. Now, <clears throat> we actually talked about this uh, new device. This is a new product we're launching within the next uh, few months. This is what we call Flongle. And Flongle is short for its contraction of flow cell dongle. And if you look at the diagram here, this is what Flongle is. Uh, the Flongle is the middle bit that's the flongle, that's the flow cell dongle, and it is an electronic component that fits onto a minion, a standard minion. And then separate from that, at the top, you've got the disposable plasticky flow cell. Uh, and the flow cell snaps in, and there are metal-to-metal -metal connectors that connect the, nan the nanopores to the electronics in the flongle. And what that does is it makes the flow cell much cheaper. Um, the flow cells are single use with, at the moment, uh, up to 128 usable nanopore channels, 30 microliter uh, loading volume. Um, <coughs> and the flongle itself, the actual electronic part, is a one-off purchase. It's just an adapter. Uh, the repeated purchase, the repeated use item is the plastic flow cell. 
Um, Flongal, people have asked this, Flongal is also compatible with, uh, with Gridiron. Uh, so there it is on Gridiron. We will enable Gridiron usage. And that means you can run five Flongals and their flow cells in parallel. Flongal uh, will be licensed for service use on Gridiron, but it will not be licensed for service use on uh, Miniron. Um, <clears throat> now, the sort of rough specifications are, the release specification is you should get around one to one and a half gigabases out of a Flongal flow cell. Uh, I'll show a graph in a minute. That's in about uh, 10 to 16 hours. Uh, we think we can get to three gigabases from the current one to eight channel Flongal. Um, there is scope for putting more channels in in future, potentially, uh, other tricks. But at the moment, those are the rough release specifications. Uh, obviously, you can compare that to other recently announced products on the market. Um, uh, but we think, obviously, we th design our products with uh, headroom for uh, future improvements in mind. Um, <coughs> I hear some nice pickies. So there's uh, the, blue, this, the blue picture there is an actual flongal flow cell viewed from the top and the membrane material has been dyed with a fluorescent dye and the glowing circles are the membranes, those are the soap bubbles into which nanopores are inserted. And people who run our other products will be familiar with the chip map it's called, which the green channels show that you're sequencing. Green means, is good, green means active channel that's sequencing. And the important, uh, the important news here is that we are getting electrical data through this system, which is the same as what we get from Minion. So uh, the electrical connections and all the rest of it uh, are performant in line with what we expect from Minion. So it is in every respect, though it's a different format, it is in every respect a shrunk down Minion flow cell. Uh, so that is looking pretty good. We're quite happy with that. So just to uh, zoom in on those output projections. So um, again, we, we, we are looking at around a gigabase in nine hours, perhaps 1.6 gigabases in 16 hours. Uh, and again, that's really just a, uh, uh, directly in line with the kind of performance we see from a single Minion set of channels. The behavior is, to all intents and purposes, the same as Minion. Uh, one key difference for, for Nanopore geeks and Nanopore followers is there's no MUX on Flongal. It's a single MUX, um, uh, which means that you only have the one to eight channels. There are no hidden channels that you can go back to later. Now, let's talk about release and availability. Um, so what we've done is we've come up with a pricing, and this is our introductory pricing. It may change. Uh, which is around $90 to $100 per Flongal flow cell. And in the early access packs, they're sold in packs, and that's the approximate pricing that you will get with Flongal. Now, in future, we can look at different um, pricing schemes. Uh, about 18 months ago, I think a little bit longer, I, I spoke about a pricing scheme, an elastic pricing scheme we were looking at called Zero Hour Pricing. And that would work a bit like a taxi, where you have a, a low minimum, and then you pay for the amount of data. And that would allow us to make Flongal flow cells even cheaper, where you want uh, smaller, quicker tests. But if you want a reasonable amount of data, at say one to two or three gigabases, the pricing would scale on a kind of curve that still makes it quite attractive. Now we are, that is still on the back burner, that is still looming in the background, ready to be brought back. But as far as the product introduction goes, we're going with a very simple uh, two, uh, two tariffs based on the number of flow cells in a pack that gives you approximately $100 per flow cell. And uh, <clears throat> now a key point there about these Flongal flow cells is that they're completely compatible with all of our existing sample preps. So that means they can do DNA, they can do cDNA, they can do direct RNA, uh, you can multiplex, you can do amplicons, the whole lot, the whole shebang is the same. However, um, where I am taking this in the future is towards a version that may have the sample prep, or at least the library prep, encapsulated inside the flow cell. Because we're driving towards just add DNA, or even just add blood. That's, uh, you, people who follow us know that's where we're going. So there will be future versions that 
simplify and encapsulate a lot of the costs into the disposable per se. And the reason for that is because we think that there are a lot of people who will do more things if they are quicker, easier and cheaper. Uh, that's the basic premise behind the Flongle device. We think that, for example, if you had, uh, if you combined Flongle with a targeting strategy or an Amplicon strategy, uh, you have something that can become a clinical device, for example. If you, um, you know, if you target it towards um, other field uses, you have a much better field system. So it really pushes us towards more ubiquitous, low-cost uh, sequencing, possibly where people are looking for a defined answer, uh, but also possibly where uh, in the lab you're, you just want to do gigabase of bacterium at a lower price point. Uh, so that is the Flungal product. It will be available uh, in Q2 and uh, we think fully commercialized in Q3. Obviously, I am pushing to bring those timelines forward quite aggressively. Um, you can order them, importantly, you can start buying them, uh, or the, at least the store will be live on the 30th of April this year. Okay. I thought I'd talk a little bit about some, uh, the, the, the kit landscape is quite complicated. I just want to talk about a couple of things here. So, um, we're always working to improve our kits and our flow cells. And again, people who are long-term nanopore users will have noticed probably that within the past couple of months, there has been quite a dramatic uh, improvement in, in, um, in the uh, quality and predictability of your nanopore runs. And there's a number of factors there, all hidden, just in, in incremental updates, really. Uh, minor version revisions, quality control, um, removing things that aren't necessary, better testing. All that's been going on in the background, and all of that will continue to go on in the background. Um, uh, so one thing we've, we've done is we've, uh, we've made the system more sensitive. It will catch more DNA. So what was happening previously is if people put, didn't put enough DNA in, they wouldn't get a very high yield. Well, now it's much more tolerant to lower amounts of DNA. It will catch more DNA. Um, and the rapid kit in particular, we've improved. Uh, the latest RADO4, um, as you can see, are giving very high uh, utilization of nanopores. Um, and there are people now reporting 16, 17 gigabase runs. We've had 16, 17 gigabase runs out of a single minion flow cell. Even, uh, even the weaker runs that people were getting are now typically in the high single-figure Gs. Um, and it will go up further. There are further improvements coming. There are further small incremental improvements that will take those high yields beyond 20G and the lower quartile of yields above 10G. That is all coming over the coming uh, months and weeks. Uh, and one of those is going to be launched quite soon, I think, uh, in March. This is what we call, it's called Kit 9, not very sexy. But it's, uh, it's LSK 109, one of the best um, performing kits. And what it does is it gives you uh, longer reads on average and uh, higher throughput. It enriches for longer fragments. Um, it incorporates DNA repair. One thing that we think happens is that um, you get backbone nicks and things like that on some samples. Um, it's a fragmentation-free protocol, finally. I mean, you shouldn't really be fragmenting. Uh, if you want long reads, as other people have shown in their own work externally. Um, and it reinforces the point, one of the features of the platform is that read length approximately equates to fragment length. In other words, your fragment distribution largely governs or limits your read length distribution. Um, the ligation step is improved. It's a higher concentration of adapters and a better buffer. Uh, and the whole thing gives us, we think, around 50 KB uh, N50 or L50, whatever you call it, with a tail going out to 150 or 200. Um, so it's looking pretty good uh, in all respects. And uh, again, so 10G or more of in 20 hours, so more than 10G over 48 hours, of very long reads. Uh, that's our own supported kit. There are third party efforts in that space. You've, you may have seen them. Other people have done these ultra long protocols with other methods and uh, you're free to use those as well, of course. But we are actively developing 
long and ultra long methods whilst maintaining very high throughput. And there's a very active research program now also to boost sensitivity. And we've had our first glimpses actually of uh, a version of the flow cell where you can start with nanogram DNA into the library prep and still get over 10 gigabases out the end. Uh, I'm, I'm going to sa probably save that for London Calling. Now we launched our direct RNA sequencing. That is where we, um, we actually rub up against an RNA molecule and measure it. Um, when was that? It wasn't that long ago. Was it six months ago? Um, we didn't really know how popular it would be. We thought it might be popular. It has turned out to be very, very popular in the RNA world. Um, so for those people, I just want to reassure you that um, more is coming. Um, the best direct RNA runs we've seen in field are around 5G per flow cell. And the main reason for that is because the motor, it's a different motor that controls the movement of the DNA. It's slower. That's the main reason for the yield differences between direct RNA and DNA. And we're working very actively to find a new motor protein that will run at a much faster speed. And again, all, most of the other refinements we've applied to DNA should then apply to RNA, and we should then see dramatic boosts in direct RNA yield. Now, um, uh, obviously with RNA, it's more complicated because there are quite a lot of modified bases. And um, there's work internally and there's work externally now on calling modified bases. Um, and there's quite a lot of work going on in the latest kits and kit updates to make the uh, adapter step, the um, uh, preparing the direct RNA for sequencing to make it more efficient. So obviously what we want there are full length RNA molecules from end to end. They have to be captured correctly. There are scenarios where that doesn't happen in, in, a, very, in a minority of cases. We don't want the RNA to, uh, to snap and we don't want it to get uh, otherwise snagged. There's effort to do there. And we want the sampling to be proportional. We want high abundant to be sampled proportionally and low abundant to be sampled proportionally. That's largely the case even now, but uh, I'm sure it can be refined further. So direct RNA is off to a good start and uh, there are better versions coming is what I want to tell people who have been investing in that technology already. Uh, and again, if you go and search around, you'll find quite a lot of public work is being done on it uh, already. The first papers are appearing. There does seem to be a lot of excitement about it. Uh, so uh, we are investing more effort in boosting that application and the underlying technology to support it. Um, <clears throat> you may have seen that the base calling is actually not bad. Um, it's pretty comparable to DNA, a little bit lower. There are a lot of modified bases in RNA and our standard base callers are only trained on four bases. Most people know that. Uh, there's a to-do list, which in includes base calling modified bases and damaged bases. Uh, but the, the latest base callers are actually pretty good on direct RNA. You know, they're, they're uh, very usable for what most people want to do. Most people want to know what the transcript is. They want to know which exons are present. They want to be able to map it and they want to be able to count it. Uh, and some of the more extreme applications involve the modified bases. Uh, I mentioned earlier, throughput has gone up and we have our second generation of motor in development. And if we can get to 500 bases per second on that motor, the throughput should be comparable to DNA. Now, so, so we didn't really focus on human genome sequencing as, our, as part of our uh, commercial strategy when we launched uh, our first product. MinIron isn't really, it wasn't ever <laughs> designed or meant for whole human genome sequencing. I mean, clearly that should, that should, uh, that must be obvious to people. Certainly when we designed it, I didn't have that in mind. We had lots of other things in mind. However, people have actually uh, been attempting and successfully attempting to use MinIron as a way to do human genome resequencing. Uh, but uh, the device that we have been working on that really is geared up towards that is Promethean. Um, so the, uh, you saw the recent paper, which actually, by the way, we, I don't think we had anything to do with formally. Uh, not, not a nanopore thing per se. Uh, it, it was on archive for a long time, and then it got published in Nature, and there's an explosion of uh, 
uh, the tension around that. They used a lot of flow cells. Well, I think that's partly because it was done quite a long time ago, relatively speaking, over a year ago, and a year is a long time in Nanapur. And our yields have gone up quite dramatically since then. I think they'd, they'd have far fewer flow cells if they did it now. But anyway, the device that we designed for this job is Promethean. Um, and Promethean has 48 individually addressable hot swappable flow cells that you can run for 10 minutes or three or four days. Um, and we are now quite reliably getting uh, well over 100, maybe 125 gigabases from each Promethean flow cell. So that gives you, uh, you know, around four or five terabases per, per box. Uh, and as I'll show in a minute, that's just the start. Uh, we, I, I, that's probably about 50% of where we want to get to with Promethean. Um, and there's a graph here of some runs that we've done in the past couple of weeks, uh, and some of these samples, uh, as I'll show in a minute. Uh, you'll notice, by the way, the runtime. So when, when I announced this product originally, I said 48-hour flow cell, but I hinted, I hinted it might be possible to have long-run flow cells, and we've now done that. So Promethean flow cells can get you to 100 hours, or possibly even longer, um, uh, uh, under some schemes. So there is, uh, for people who've been very patient with Promethean, you know, there is a lot of upside built into the system. It will produce more data and be cheaper than what we told you <laughs> uh, when you bought it. Let me just say that and thank you very much for being patient with it. Um, so here are some runs recently. Uh, some are bacterial and some are human. Uh, the standard NA12878 sample, I think, are the red lines. And again, 80 to 100 gigabases, 125 gigabases is now the new normal internally. Uh, <coughs> routinely over 90. And 90 gigabases is a 30-fold human genome. Now, <coughs> just talk about that. So those runs, however, uh, those runs are not using a very important feature of our technology called Active Unblock. And um, <coughs> what that means is that occasionally nanopores will block. Um, that's fine as long as on a per-channel basis you can unblock them. And our software detects a blockage. It inverts the potential and unblocks them on a per-channel basis. Now these runs on this graph, uh, these, these 80 to 120 G runs were not using that feature. So we now have that feature working as of the last, uh, last week or so. And the graph on the left here is uh, a graph of throughput, where the light green color means you're sequencing. And it's, it's sort of time on the, um, utilization time on the Y, uh, and hours on the X, I think. And the runs I've just cited at 120G are represented pretty much by the lower left-hand graph there, the one where it says strand. And you can see that about half the time on the, older, on the old firmware, about half the time the Promethean was, uh, was blocked. Well, we've now fixed that with a bit of firmware jiggering. And you can see now that on the latest runs, <coughs> we can nearly, nearly double, maybe 70% maybe additional data on top of what we were getting last week, as it were, or two weeks ago. So I anticipate that we will get to 200G on Promethean within a week or two. And obviously I'll be tweeting those graphs when we're at 200. Uh, so that's all good news. And that's a firmware update, software update, that we can roll out to existing Promethean users very quickly. Now typically there's a lag between what we can do and what customers can do, and they usually catch up. But by the time they catch up, we move on. So what's happening in field with Promethean runs is people are getting now the best runs in the last week or three are now topping 50G. There's one on right now, I think in Australia, which is, or it's in the Netherlands, I'm not sure which one, which is probably heading for around 70G, I would guess. Um, so um, I think the latest batch of flow cells that went out, also if we apply the active unblock, I think even, even the mediocre um, preps will be well above 50G. And in our mind, that is, that was, as we said, that was the trigger for full commercialization of Promethean. 
Um, <clears throat> so let's just look at the uh, Promethean release plan. So we had the alpha systems uh, over a year ago. And most people out there now have uh, a beta, probably, um, or alpha beta. I think the, the betas ship, actually, they've got alphas. The betas are shipping in about a week's time. And we're anticipating on beta systems uh, greater than 125 gigabases per flow cell should be easily achievable. Uh, that's half of what we are getting in-house. And on a per box basis, that's three to six terabases of data per box. Now, if you buy a Promethean, uh, you're not really buying the box, you're buying into the product. And um, <coughs> we will then swap out the system for the Mark 1 Promethean <coughs> on the far right hand side here when it becomes available. So you will have a migration path from the system you have to the Mark 1. We'll do that for you. <coughs> and underneath these uh, graphics, you can see the cost per gigabase of, uh, of the different uh, systems. I'll let you look at those at your leisure. There's too much data there for me to um, talk about. Now, Promethean is now fully released in the shop as of, I think, yesterday or the day before yesterday. That means that anybody can now purchase Prometheans and flow cell packs. Anybody. Um, <clears throat> there you go. It's now fully, in our view, it is within a few months anyway, once these things are out there, it will be fully commercialized, uh, embodying the features and the performance I've just uh, outlined. <clears throat> now, what does that mean? So I'm on record as being skeptical about this $1,000 gene, human genome business. Um, what does it mean? I mean, it was, it was a useful concept. It was coined, in, I think it was coined at Selexa in the, in the uh, run about 2002. Useful concept when it was a long way away. <clears throat> but as you get close to it, it becomes largely irrelevant. Um, but anyway, for the, for the sake of, um, you know, people on the periphery, let me try and talk about that. So Luminar announced their um, $1,000 genome <clears throat> on the HiSeq X10 in 2015. And the, the numbers in the table on the right here are taken from their, uh, their numbers. And um, they've quoted a reagent price per run of $13,000, genomes per run 16 at 30-fold coverage. Uh, <coughs> they've uh, cited a hardware amortization uh, price of $137, and they've cited sample prep at 5565. And that was the basis of their sub $1,000 human genome claim. Now, on Promethean, just I want to do a sort of like-for-like, like. where, where it's possible. Remember, we don't have fixed run times and all that stuff, but let me try, try and do a like-for-like. Like. Um, there's no instrument amortization, per se, because we, we don't sell boxes in the conventional fashion. Um, the maintenance service is $4. Uh, the flow cell price on the cheapest tariff is $625. Uh, library preparation, we think all in, is 124 That will reduce. And the extraction and sample prep, we price at $40. So at 30-fold coverage, you can argue about whether that's enough and all the rest of it, uh, we think that Promethean will deliver a $800 uh, human genome at scale. Now, there are loads of caveats on these calculations, and all of the caveats have been fully expounded elsewhere. You can go and look at them uh, very properly. Uh, one of the major caveats is that most of the costings require you to run the machine at very high utilization on a very large number of samples in order to get the cost down. Um, <clears throat> somewhat true on Promethean. You know, you, you have to commit to a certain number of flow cells per unit time. Uh, but there is a lot more flexibility, I think. So, so I think we will see over the coming months uh, customers, importantly, not us, claiming sub-$1,000 whole human genome sequencing on Promethean. I think that will happen in the first half of this year. We debated about whether to have a competition about that and all the rest of it, and we think that people are going to do it anyway. We think there's no need to incentivize people to do that. So um, uh, the first nanopore sub-$1,000 human genomes, I think you're going to see over the coming few months which is very timely, following on quite nicely from the, um, the Minine human genome paper. Now, so the question, okay, so, <clears throat> so can you do a $1,000 human genome on a Minine? I, I, I've spent years thinking about that. 
and it's difficult um, because you'd be looking at getting 90G from a flow cell if the flow cell is priced at well under $1,000. And uh, <coughs> even, in, even at 1,000 basis per second with all the channels running for two and a half days, you can just about fall over that line. But realistically, there's no headroom left. You know, you, you, I think that's actually quite difficult. So you might say, well, that's easy. Use two flow cells and bring the price down to $400 per flow cell. Well, you know, that might happen. I mean, the, the price of benign flow cells might come down. The yields will go up. Is 45G on a benign flow cell feasible? I think it's feasible. It's a stretch goal, but I think it is feasible. The other thing you might say is, well, why not have a minine Mark II? Why not bring out a minine with more channels? And that is the other way to do it. That is keep the flow cell price roughly the same, but double or treble the number of channels. And of course, that can be done. That is, of course, perfectly feasible, and that would let you do a human genome on a minine. And as long as you're... The point is, if you buy one minine flow cell at under $1,000 and do a whole human genome, then it's a very different proposition from committing to do 10,000 human genomes over three years on a $10 million box, obviously. Uh, but who would do that? I, I often wonder who would do that. I, I'm not sure. I've never been sure there's a market for that, really, although it would be cool. Um, another approach is think about 30-fold coverage. Do you need 30-fold coverage? So one of the features of the platform that we've spoken about previously and that people have published on is a feature called Read Until, uh, much better named as adaptive sampling, it's called. Uh, I can't explain it in detail now. It's too much words. But it might be possible, it can certainly, certainly possible, we think, to select fragment sizes dynamically, that is to only focus on long fragments. You can certainly flatten coverage with read until. Um, that has been demonstrated previously. Could you, could you adaptively sample haplotypes with read until? Is that possible in, a, in an intelligent way that brings the coverage requirements down? I think it is. I think that's a stretch goal as well. I think we can make the system more efficient than uh, a sort of shotgun fragmentation, 30-fold Poisson allele sampling type thing. I think we can have a much more directed wave sequencing. So all of that is, in, again, in the back of our minds, thinking in the future. But it may be possible at some point to do human genomes as a one-off for under $1,000 on a very cheap device without any massive commitments. The question is, in my mind, who's going to do that? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll skip over that because I just verbalized it all. Now, again, read until is a very important feature. Um, there is a, an API that has been refreshed recently uh, that is under, under developer license. Um, on the agenda for the first half of this year is for read until to come back with a vengeance. Uh, there's a wide variety of applications for it, uh, from selecting regions of interest, from balancing amplicons, uh, from rejecting human or only reading human. There's a very large number of cool stuff, things you can do with read until. And uh, it is now on the, uh, it was an experimental feature, it's very much on the agenda now to productize read until. To do that, of course, we need very fast online real-time signal processing so that when a molecule is in the pore, we can identify what it is and then either keep it or kick it out. That's how read until works. Now that, seg that segues me into something I'm going to announce in about five slides time. But just hold that thought. Just hold read until in your brain for about five more slides. Now, <clears throat> okay, in the long list of you'll nevers that we have had to sit through for 10 years, uh, almost all of them now have fallen. You'll never get long reads, you'll never launch a product, you'll never commercialize it, you'll never get throughput, you'll never get the cost down, you'll never build a company, you'll never build a commercialization team. The last one now, I think, really, is consensus accuracy. This is the thing that is uh, held against us and our customers but only for some applications. For many others, it doesn't really matter at the moment. But for some applications, this is the thing that we are going to solve in the first half of this year. 
Now let me talk about how we are doing that. So um, already, consensus accuracy is improving. We're making a number of uh, tools, and there are people out there, Nanopolish probably being the, the, the prime example, of ways to improve consensus accuracy. Um, we have our own tool that we're developing, of course, because we can support it, called Madarka. Um, <clears throat> and again, Nanopore aficionados will tell you that the main source of error now in, in consensus are the edges of homopolymers. Uh, a, less, a much lesser source of error is uh, methylation or damage, and those are just an un unmodeled signal that we can learn. Um, that's not easy, but it's work. People have demonstrated that in principle. That just needs to be rolled in. Um, we are dependent on reference quality, so if our training sets, remember we use a machine learning base caller, if our training sets aren't right, the base calling won't be right, there's work to do there. But the vast majority of our consensus accuracy now is where we are out by one base. Just one base. Well, that's, that's the majority of them. Uh, uh, again, even that has improved dramatically over the past six months. So, how do we go forwards? So there are three core approaches. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one of them is the default that will happen anyway. And that is continuous improvement of the algorithms. There is still more to be had from the signal. Other people outside of Nanapur have demonstrated that. Um, our current methods probably systematically underestimate the length of homopolymers. There are probably corrections to use there. Uh, moving to raw data and moving to end-to-end -end trainable seek-to-seek -seek neural networks, that has opened up whole new ways of uh, training that are uh, helping us to improve incrementally the base calling. Uh, and there are others. So ongoing continuous up upgrades to the existing software. Still headroom there. Now the next one is my favorite. I am actually quite excited about this. And that is to change the pore. And we are looking at now chemistries that can read homopolymers. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, and the third way, which is kind of interesting, but I, I'm not sure is product, but it is certainly useful to understand, is where we modify the sample. Uh, so in essence, simplifying grossly, uh, on short read-ahead pores, homopolymers give flat signals. Now, there are some simple steps where we can unflatten the signal and make it accessible to the machine learning base caller. Uh, I will talk about that in some more detail. Uh, so, um, so again, uh, there, there are some uh, improvements in the pipeline. Um, <clears throat> probably the biggest one is simply to broaden out the training sets and learn more context. Uh, that's been ongoing. Um, <clears throat> another interesting area is 1D squared. Um, again, aficionados will know that whilst it all works quite nicely, the underlying algorithm is really quite ugly. And uh, you can get 97% accuracy from 1D squared. We don't think that's scratching the surface. We think there's a whole new algorithm there, probably working at the raw data level, that boosts that quite significantly. It's not easy, though, but there's certainly headroom in 1D squared. Um, and then there are, other, uh, there are other correction methods that we think we can learn and apply to the data. And then one, one important thing not shown on here is altering run conditions. We know that we can play with salt, temperature, and other factors, and we can change signal in a way that can make it more readable. <coughs> <coughs> so all of those are the ongoing methods that the team here are working on. Now, another way to do it is to change the pore. So here's the pore, here's the R9.x. This is the pore that we use at the moment. And it's this sort of washer in a, washer in a tube type shape. And you can see that most of the signal is coming from around five bases, but there's actually quite a lot of peripheral signal as well. I don't want to oversimplify. Uh, there's quite a smear of signal on there. But it's a fairly sharp, quote unquote, reader. What that means is that on mixed sequence, this is the, the, um, the aligned squiggles on the top here, on the right-hand side, on mixed sequence, we perfectly good sequencing. 
But when we hit homopolymer sections, as shown on the bottom one, we have flat signal. And at the moment, we're using things like dwell time. We're using time domain to estimate the number of bases in the flat signal. There are other tricks we've used previously where we can uh, look for substeps and other things in the signal, tiny changes. Uh, again, those are not by no means discarded. But for the purposes of this talk, let's just consider homopolymers to have flat signal, as shown here. And what you're seeing here are 10 Ts, some other bases, 10 Ts, I think it's G, A, G, A or something, 10 bases, some other 10 Ts, some other bases, 10 Ts. Okay. So we're now looking at um, <coughs> two new pores. One is a pore called R8 that we never released. Uh, it's, uh, we have a lot of pores. This one is a good pore. I like it. Uh, it was, I think we found it. It has a very long tubular barrel that spans quite a large number of bases. Uh, now what that means is that um, Homopolymers, which are less than the length of that span, which is quite long, have non-flat signal, which is then amenable to our training pipeline. The other pole we're looking at is slightly different, and uh, Hagen Bailey, actually, in his lab, wrote a paper on this years ago. Is a pore where we have uh, two narrow bits separated by another bit. Yeah, two of them. And that convolves and complicates the signal over a distance. Uh, but out of all these pores, we get very clean signal. And we now know, I can tell you why I'm talking about this today, trainable signal. That's the key for us. So they all work. The question is, which one will be the best? And this new one, I think, the I, think the, I, like, I like R8. The, the team here like R10. Uh, uh, this new one um, is looking very uh, exciting. Now, the third approach is it is possible during the sample prep to have a hidden step where you do a complementary strand synthesis or amplification. It doesn't matter, but certainly a complementary strand synthesis where we incorporate a fifth base at random. So we put in a fifth base. Um, but when we train the neural network, we train it to a four base reference. Now what that means is as a user, if you do, this, do the same thing, <coughs> um, it will call a four base reference correctly from a five base signal where you've randomized uh, or you've um, attenuated at random part of the input signal. All that means is that you will then get incorporation of this fifth base inside homopolymer sections that will break up the homopolymer and the uh, neural networks can then call it the same as any other piece of sequence. Now, um, <coughs> this is interesting, it's all, and this kind of works. Um, I don't like it so much that it's up in the air, but it's certainly interesting I mean, we started doing this actually as a way to make training sets for modified bases. So putting in methyl C, hydroxymethyl C, and then in order to expand the base caller from four bases to seven bases, because you'd have the, you have the natural DNA, under 1D squared in a way, you have the natural DNA, and then you can get the modified complement. And that's quite a nice training set. But it also deconvolves homopolymer sections. So all three are under active development uh, as we speak, and uh, <coughs> they all kind of work. I think what this slide shows, the, the last approach is called 5B4, uh, 5B4, so five, uh, five, 5B4, yeah, quite nice. Five input bases called to four, uh, and we're already getting some pretty promising results from that one. We're getting pretty promising results from the... Um, double read ahead. And uh, my gut feel is that we will be launching that uh, before London Calling. One of those two pores as a new product. What we will do then is we will maintain the existing pores for backward compatibility 
but you will be able to buy a flow cell with either R8 or R10 in it. That's how we're going to do that. We're going to have two different pore systems, uh, which you can select at, at buy time. Hope that's clear. If not, it will become clear because I'll be tweeting results on these over the coming weeks. So anyway, we're pretty confident that one or all of these approaches, one or all of them, will close off this homopolymer consensus issue in the first half of this year. Uh, so we decided to share the, the thinking there. <coughs> Great, now, I, uh, I'd now like to introduce a new product. This is MINUT, pronounced MINUT, M-I-N-U-T-E. So what this is, is a tiny little uh, accessory for MinIron that replaces the dreaded laptop. Uh, and it, on this perspective, it actually looks bigger than it is. But if you look at the network ports, you can see how big it is. The uh, subsequent versions will get smaller. Uh, I'll just mention that, but the initial version looks like this. 12 volt power supply. It's still technically portable, but I think it's more aimed at desktop users. Um, we noticed that gridiron is easier to install, configure and run than a miniron. For a lot of users, uh, the laptop is a significant barrier to using their miniron. They have to get the right one, they panic about it. Uh, they've got to be configured, uh, blah, 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 the IT groups get involved, can it be networked, doesn't it be networked, blah, 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 yada, yada. The laptop, uh, installing USB drivers, all not good, really. Uh, all a kind of obstacle to adoption of Minine. So this is really aimed at people who want to buy a compute solution with their Minine without having to go laptop shopping, software installing, network configuring. That's the idea behind Minit. Uh, so inside Minit, there are accelerators of a, of a kind that are now <coughs> getting very cheap and very fast. And there's an ARM processor. Now, it's all pre-configured. It, it comes pre-configured. It's targeting zero configuration. That's the, the, what you say about broadband routers. So you should just plug in the MinIron and run it much closer to the gridiron experience. Um, all the base calling is done on the fly inside Minit. And FastQ is written out through USB or to a, a small SSD card. Either way, you can then sneak in at that disk to your computer for further work. Uh, <coughs> so we'll connect to one, uh, one MinIron and it will have Wi-Fi Bluetooth and the, uh, the GUI will be accessible like a broadband router through Wi-Fi Bluetooth on any device that's networked or, or through Bluetooth from your mobile phone. Uh, we are now very close to uh, having it keep up with full-on Minion runs. We're pretty close to that. Uh, we think some tweaking will get it completely online in terms of base calling. Uh, so it's preloaded. It's uh, running li li uh, Linux and Guppy. Now, you can network it but you don't need to. If networking is a problem where you are, you don't need to network it. You'll be able to write data to a portable disk drive. Now, um, in the future, I want to mention something here. I mentioned, uh, it's not on the slides, unfortunately. I can't find it anyway. I mentioned read until. Now, one of the major reasons why it would be worth investing in this is that over the course of the year, we will enable on this device and on Gridiron, we will enable our own read until system. That means you will be able to download apps, for want of a better word, modules that implement read until workflows. So for example, at runtime, you'll be able to select a, a little app that filters all human, or select an app that does barcode balancing, or select an app that only sequences very long reads. So all of those little applets, these little read until applets, will be runnable on this device, making it 
painless for everybody to access read and tell functionality. That's going to be a key feature of this product. Uh, and because it's on hardware that we are making, we can control the configuration and the support and the performance, which is, which is important. I hope that makes sense. So minute zero configuration, zero configuration, collect the min iron and run it. Pair your device, off you go. On there also will be read until. Now you can uh, register your interest in minute right now. This, it will go live in the shop on the 30th of April. And we're aiming to ship it in May. Now, obviously, I intend to bring those dates forward, <laughs> but those are the current working dates. Uh, the guide price is an individual minute will be $2,000. Uh, I assume that will incorporate support. Um, and you can also buy it as part of a starter pack. So whereas you used to buy MinIron and laptop, you can now just buy the whole lot as a bundle, minutes and minute and MinIron. Now, for people who are computer experts and bioinformaticians, this may not make any sense at all. But the fact is that more and more of our users are not in that bucket. So this does make sense. Now, I'd also like to announce the MinIron Mark 1C. This is the MinIron Mark 1C. It is a child. It is a child of MinIron and Minute. Uh, and there it is. Do I need to explain what's going on there? Is it obvious? It should be pretty obvious what's going on there. Still, I think it's still 12 volts of power supply. So it's obviously aimed at bench top, semi-portable. But again, it's uh, low hassle, no cables, zero configuration, very low footprint. That is the MinIron Mark 1C. The, the MinIron you have now is the Mark 1B. Just remember, just uh, remind everybody about that. Uh, and uh, uh, that will follow on from the availability of Minute in the summer, later in the summer. Hope that's clear. Now, some of the goodies. Um, <clears throat> there's loads of stuff I'm not talking about today, but I'm going to talk about this one because this is... I'm generally trying to talk about stuff that's going to come out before London Calling. Now... <clears throat> What causes field variability? What is it, do you think? Well, there's lots of things. Um, and one of them is this. So for a long time, we've had a system called tethering that we spoke about and filed patents on many years ago. And this is where we, um, you put DNA in, in solution, but in the sample prep, you've hybridized on a little leader, and on the leader is cholesterol. And that cholesterol likes to stick the sample to the membrane. The sample then moves around in two dimensions and you get a much more efficient on rate on the pore. All right, sounds great, right? It does sound great and it did work. The trouble is that it sticks to everything. It sticks to your pipette, it sticks to your Eppendorf. Uh, the longer you leave it in something, the more will stick. Um, it also sticks to the inside of the flow cell. There's a picture there, it coats up the flow cell so I, I, I can't remember what the factoid is, but something like 90-odd percent of the sample never makes it on, onto the membrane. The vast majority of sample disappears before it comes anywhere near a pore. Possibly the most irritating thing about it is even when it sticks to the membrane, over time it migrates away from the nanopore. It actually moves away from the nanopore. That is the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish here. And uh, it's been a contributing factor to sample loss and also um, in-run what they call um, tail-off or die-off. The throughput die-off is somewhat uh, attenuated by this cholesterol migrating away from the bleeding nanopore. So <coughs> we, are, we are refactoring this now. Um, you will notice that it is being removed from kits. And we are working on a new version where the tether is inside the flow cell and it's called factory tether that means the flow cell ships pre-tethered so all you need to do is add library uh, and the result i mentioned earlier where we can start with nanogram 
that's a nanogram into library prep and still get high yields, that's based on this technology where the tether is now built into the flow cell. And we think apart from boosting sensitivity, that will dramatically drag up the tail of, um, of bad runs. And we think this is a significant factor in that. Uh, so that will be coming out before London Calling. Uh, fairly seamless update from our point of view. And finally, I just want to mention, uh, there's been lots of talk about fancy chips. I just want to remind everybody that we are always working on the next generation of everything. And that includes the next generation of electronics. And we have a long-standing program now to develop a field effect transistor-based sensor. And that means you can get a very large number of sensing channels very cheaply, uh, replacing the existing ASICs that we have. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the good news here is that these our prototypes are working. Uh, so most of what's left is scaling up and putting it into product, really. Uh, for example, in the table here, for a Promethean size flow cell, with a FET array, we would get 600,000 channels. At 450 basis per second, that's the current speed, may double that. Um, 0.2 gigabases per second. That's a 60x human genome in 15 minutes on a single Promethean cell. Right, so again, so if, you, if you're buying into nanopore technology and Promethean, there is a migration path that I believe is very difficult for anybody else to match. Now that all remains to be seen, but just putting in people's minds that this technology has not topped out yet. So just summarize very quickly. Here's the product line. I've spoken about each of them at some length. Um, <coughs> importantly, the uh, approximate cost per gigabase, the sort of punch line is at the bottom here. I mean, that's really what most people focus on. Two to five dollars on Promethean at scale. And then you're looking at 30 to 90 on Flongel. Now, I haven't spoken about tons of stuff today um, because I'm saving it for London Calling. Haven't spoken about Smidge Iron. Haven't spoken about uh, Zumbador. Uh, haven't spoken about our single cell platform that we're working on. Haven't spoken at length about Voltrax. Haven't spoken about our DNA synthesis platform and loads of other stuff that we are saving for later in the year. Now, for what I have spoken about today, here are the approximate release timelines. So the latest chemistry, the latest high quality flow cells and that uh, active unblocking, uh, you can get a lot of that right now if you're a Promethean user. Minions in China, you can order them now, get them after Chinese New Year. The Promethean Beta uh, uh, ships on the 20th. That's important because that's a completely runnable Promethean where you can run, I think, half of the flow cells at once, live. I think that's significant. Um, there's a read until developer release coming up, but remember, we are now working on encapsulating that in hardware. Uh, there's a new Guppy coming. Guppy's getting faster and faster all the time. And there's a new Minnow GUI coming, which I think people will like a lot. Uh, the feedback on it has been very positive. So again, we're always trying to improve the usability. And that Promethean Active Unblock that should roughly double, or perhaps 70% extra yields for Promethean, that will be out on the 28th at the latest. Now, Kit 9 is in March, March 10th. There's a Voltrax update, haven't spoken about today, but that's coming. And the field kit, which now works very well, the field kit general availability, important for field sequences, uh, that will be available on March 27th. Uh, by Q2, I'm aiming to get that uh, novel tethering system out, that uh, factory tether. Uh, Actually, I'm going to be quite aggressive about that, despite what this says. Uh, Flongal early access will begin in Q2. You can express interest now. Uh, upgrade to direct RNA, we're targeting for Q3. That's probably yield speed, possibly base calling. Uh, minutes, we're looking at late Q2, early Q3. 
Uh, the V2 Voltrax, which I haven't spoken about, but we will be talking about in detail at London Calling, Q3. The V2 Voltrax is really the fully commercially runnable, all singing, all dancing Voltrax. Uh, some 1D squared upgrades, Q3, those will be significant. And then I haven't spoken about Zumbador today. I'm going to speak about Zumbador at London Calling, probably launching that in Q3. So with that, and there's loads of other stuff, there's always, always stuff I forget about. With that, I will just remind everybody that 24th, 25th of May, that will be showing all this stuff I've just mentioned, and hopefully we'll have users talking about it, but then we'll be talking about what's coming out in the second half of the year at London Calling on 24th, 25th of May. And with that, I'm going to stop, <coughs> and there somewhere is a... Uh, Website of questions. Let me see if I can find that. I've lost it, of course. There we go. Oh, blimey. All right, so I'm now looking at a website of questions. Uh, I will start at the bottom. I will read them out, and uh, I will attempt to answer them verbally. So number one is, will Promethean be open for FIFA service? Yes. It is right now. It's open fee for service. Somebody's asked which will be the starting DNA input for the new ligation kit. I don't know, but it's it's getting lower all the time. I don't. You know, the, obviously we are working hard to lower that, and we have proof of concept on very low amounts of starting DNA. <coughs> Same release timeline for flongal or minine. I don't understand that. I've given the flongal release timelines. It's the first half of this year, effectively. Uh, how many gigabases... Oh, that's a complicated question. Uh, that's probably better answered in publications. How many gigabases need to, needed to get a good human genome sequence? Well, I've been quoting 30-fold coverage, which is the sort of standard. With those improvements to uh, homopolymers, I'd stick with 30. Again, I think with adaptive sampling, it might be possible to reduce that. Um, are flow cells and those for flongal shipped to RT? We are trying to make everything uh, ambient shippable. So no cold chain. Obviously, if you want anybody to sequence anything anywhere, it's got to be no cold chain. So, uh, and I, I think we have quite a lot of stuff now that ships at ambient temperature. So the intention will be to ship at ambient. Um, okay, I've explained that one. How much cheaper will Flongal become? Okay, that, that's complicated. It will become cheaper. It becomes cheaper at scale because manufacturing scale reduces the cost. Um, we have our zero hours flow cell uh, uh, pricing. That has a minimum on it. Uh, and then you pay for the additional like a taxi. Um, so, uh, you know, it will become cheaper, for sure. And the more you use, the cheaper it gets, basically. Uh, what type of contaminants in DNA preps could interfere with... Signal? That's quite a broad question. Um, the system is surprisingly tolerant to stuff, cell lysates and other stuff. Um, the main worry we have is actually um, quite strong detergents that can disrupt the membrane. Uh, so... Um, most things that block the pore can be deblocked electronically, so they're only transient. Are there reference samples with reference modifications in DNA or RNA? Now, <coughs> that's a good question. Not really. Uh, you probably it's a, okay. So, if you had reference samples with reference modifications, you could sequence them, and then you could learn them. And then you've got a five base base cooler or a six base base cooler. That's what we are working on. Um, we might have to make the modifications. We might have to construct a training set. Uh, somebody wants an update on 16S. I'm going to leave that for somebody else to do. Um, I'd like to know more about the single cell sequencing device. Well, I'm saving that for London Calling. So that, that question will be answered then at London Calling. Uh, how can I minimise the error rate comparing with a Lumina short rest? Again, that's a very broad question. Um, if you're talking about consensus error, then you need a good consensus caller. 
and we need to just get rid of these last um, residual problems. Again, mostly homopolymer. I hope I answered that. It should then become comparable. It should converge, really. There's no fundamental limit on nanopore accuracy, actually. Uh, although the last few percent are difficult to get, um, uh, it will come. It will converge. Let's have a look down. Um, so those are all the questions. I've only got 47 showing on here. I want to know how... Oh, no, I've done, done that one, done that one. OK, there we go. I've answered them all. 47 questions. Let me just click refresh. OK, more questions. Um, <clears throat> please advise the link where we can register with Minute. I'm going to get somebody from our commercial team to do that. Um, James Ferguson is asking what happened to FPGA. So uh, we still develop on FPGA, but what has happened is they sort of do this. And GPUs are right now leaping ahead of FPGAs. Um, uh, that's the basic story. Uh, FPGAs are very difficult to program. <laughs> quite difficult. GPU is quite easy to program. In theory, FPGAs are more efficient. But then commercially, because of all this, all this machine learning AI stuff, GPUs are now doing this. So for now, we're going with GPUs. Uh, direct RNA of bacterial mRNA protocol? Question uh, mark. I will leave that to an applications person to answer. Uh, we want to purchase several min-irons for our department, but so far, nobody's got back to us. Well, you email me, clive.brown at nanoporetech.com, and I will make sure somebody get back, gets back to you if you want to order several min-irons. Um, <clears throat> we are curious to find out more on the Zumbador. A little teaser. Well, I've done that online already. Uh, it's getting better all the time. Um, the point we're at now, roughly speaking, is you can slurp up a droplet of something, uh, liquid, blood, saliva, colony pick. You can sort of hold it in your hand and you can dob that onto a flow cell and you can get full coverage of a bacterium uh, within about 10 minutes. That's roughly where we are with Zumbador. It has to be good. Because of all the hype around liquid biopsy, it has to be really good. So it has to do blood, and the yields have to be quite good uh, before it comes out. But I'm pretty confident that the team will have that ready by London Calling. Pretty confident. Uh, 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 and all my questions have now disappeared again. Or have they gone to the bottom? Oh, here we go. Yes, single cell sequencing will be possible. So we're working on, I'll just hint at, it's still, it's in, it's in late development. We are working on a single cell sequencing system that will do single cells in parallel. Um, uh, 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 how about progress on protein sequencing? That's a long term thing that we will get back to in future. What about targeted RNA? Uh, again, I'm sure we can do that. Good question. Maybe that's one for the applications group at London Calling. Certainly feasible to do that. And yes, you're right, actually. I bet targeting RNA is very popular. Um, are you working on ligation for RNA? A lot of RNA questions. I don't know. I, I don't know about that. I'll, I'll look into it. Uh, uh, how you can select ultra-long reads with read until. Shall I talk about that? Is it secret? I'm not sure it's secret, really. So you can... Uh, is, it, is it safe to talk about that? I wonder if it's safe to talk about that. It can be done. Maybe I'll save that one for London Calling. I'm not sure what the IP situation is, but it can be done. Uh, what about Voltrax V2? Released before London Calling? I don't think so. I think at or around London Calling. Uh, 
Are there plans for using MinIron in clinical testing? Well, if there are, a clinical lab or a translational lab will be doing it, and we will support them. Uh, what do we need to make that happen? Well, um, I, I've never done a clinical device. Uh, Gordon has. Um, we do now have a commercial team who, whose job is to push products into clinical. And I'm sure they will get in touch with you about that. Obviously, Flongal is more designed for clinic because it's cheap, it's quick, it should be really easy. You can ask a fairly straightforward question. Presence, absence, uh, throw it away. Obviously, Flongal is more clinic-y than Minine, per se. Uh, how much does Minute cost? I put the price up. It was, on the, it was on, on the slide. If you go back to the slide, I had the, minutes cost, the minute costs up there in the little table at the bottom. I verbalized it too. Um, uh, somebody else asking me how you select long reads. Love that idea. I, I'm just going to not talk about it today. I might tweet it if the IP situation is clear. Um, so that's it. I've got 53 questions, and I think I've dealt with all of them. Oh, there's some more coming in. Okay, some more here. Somebody says, minute, nice. Okay, okay, fine. Somebody's just telling us uh, that we're doing the right thing. What does FAST5 contain? All of that is documented on our customer portal. It contains everything you, can rec you need to view and call the data. So it's the raw data, it's the parameters for the run, it's the versioning, and when you've base called, it can also contain the base calls. Uh, that's what FAST5 contains. And it then goes on to say, um, raw current data, yes, that should be in there. Binary base call data, yes, that should be in there. Um, can we improve base calls by using newer version of base callers? Yes, you can. You should always try and use the latest version of the base caller, because it will be better. Um, somebody here proposing to submit reference sequences. Well, we've debated uh, creating a website where people can put reference sequences on which we can train the base callers. You know, if people have modified references, very high quality references with things in them, maybe we should do that. Then we can incorporate them in the training process. Then we can bootstrap up the base calling quality. Uh, what, what's about the double read pour you talked about at LC27? I just spoke about it. I had a picture of it. I just spoke about a double read, but that's the picture. I just spent 10 minutes talking about that. Um, can the base calling software, as it develops, be used on data collected historically? Yes. You, uh, I think in almost all cases, you can go back to old data. You need to match the poor version with the base caller version. So if you, if, you, if you go back too far, if you go back before R9 point something, probably not. So, so for each poor chemistry version, there's a model, i.e. a neural network, that the base caller loads that it applies to that data. So as long as you've got the right versions, it will call it. When will compute modules? Is that uh, which compute? Is that is that Promethean or is that um, minutes you're talking about there? I don't know which one that is. Da -da -da. Alpha beta box be smaller. Um, you've got the alpha beta box with a computer on the side, and then in the future, the f the final uh, Promethean will be the original small box. Anybody can purchase Promethean. Does that include ONT's competitors? Uh, I don't know. I suspect not. I think we've had a long-standing policy of not selling boxes to competitors. And the reason for that is that in the old days, when I was being toured around some of these competitors in Silicon Valley, I stuck my head around a door one day, and there they were, reverse engineering somebody else's platform. And that's why we don't, uh, we don't sell to competitors. Why make it easy for them? How many gigabases needed with nanopores to get good human... OK, I've answered that. Um, I, I, I spoke about that at some length. Uh, the rule, rule of thumb most people use is 90G. 
i.e. 30-fold coverage. The rest is down to the software. Uh, are error rates comparable between Gridiron and Promethean? Uh, yes, it's pretty much the same. Pretty much the same, actually. Uh, we, think there's a, we think there might be a slight advantage to Promethean. Uh, but it is so small as most people wouldn't notice it. But the data is pretty much the same. Uh, um, do we have a sales office rep in Kenya? Please get in touch with our commercial group. If you are in Africa, anywhere, we are quite keen to figure out how to get product to you. Uh, so please do keep in touch and we will try and figure something out. Um, on that theme, by the way, um, how do we make it even cheaper? Uh, how do we get to a point where this is sort of why I asked about doing whole human genomes on Minine, on one flow cell. How do we get it to a point where countries who don't have lots of money can do it all? And um, we're, still, we're still thinking about that. Um, still very much on the agenda. Um, <clears throat> Okay, I've answered all these. I've answered all these. I'm not seeing uh, 61 questions there. Uh, our longest read. Well, the longest read actually hasn't been done by Nanapur. The longest reads have been done in the, in the public domain. And I think it's 1.3 megabases. I think 1.3 megabases. Um, yeah. Yes, we are going towards an all-in-one device that does sample to sequence. That is where we're going. That is all the evolutionary developments I've been talking about are moving towards just add sample, whether it's on a portable handheld or a factory sequencer. That is where we're going towards. That's correct. Uh, how many minions? It's over 6,000. I don't know the exact number. Uh, we sell a few hundred a month, typically, it varies. Uh, I think with China, remember we haven't been selling in China for three years. I think with China now having full access, I think the Minine numbers will go a lot higher. Okay, so with that, I think I'm losing my voice. I think it's time to stop.